Right, hello everyone, welcome to Heifer Ranch located in Perryville, Arkansas. My name is Tyler Pearson. I'm a program officer here with our team at Heifer USA and thank you so much for joining us today to talk about caring for chicks in the brooder. We have a great presentation lined up for you today. Whether you are a beginner who is just thinking about starting out or if you're a seasoned pastured poultry veteran, we hope that you'll find valuable and useful information in this video. We've got a lot to cover. We're joined by a really great person who has a ton of knowledge, so I'm super excited for this video today. If you're watching live, just type your questions in the live chat right over there, I think, uh, and we will answer as many of those questions as we can. I'll be monitoring those. If you're watching the recorded version of this video, just type your question down in the comments below and let us know what's going on with you and your poultry enterprise at your home or farm, and we will answer every single question there as well. We have a lot to cover in today's video. We're gonna give you a behind the scenes look at all the equipment and all the uh, infrastructure of this very large chicken brooder where we can raise up to 4,000 chicks at a time that we're uh, including in our pastured poultry operation here at Heifer Ranch. We're also gonna be looking uh, at how we care for chicks when they first arrive, the daily chores that we go through while they're in this brooder phase and what we do to get the chicks ready uh, to take them out to pasture. So we've got some really cool cutscenes and videos that we're gonna show you. We have some really great uh, documents and PDFs that you're gonna be able to download that will help you in your farming journey. And stay tuned until the end of this video because we're gonna give you a chance to win some really cool prizes as well. So thank you so much again for joining us to talk about for caring for chicks in the brooder. I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Sam Noble. Sam runs the pastured poultry enterprises here at Heifer USA. That's all of our turkeys and all of our chickens. She comes to us with a wealth of information and knowledge, and today is her birthday. So happy birthday, Sam. <laughs> Everyone in the chat can wish you a happy birthday as well. Thanks, Thank guys. <laughs> Thank you so much. So let's get started and just talk a little bit about the brooder space itself. Maybe if you wanna give a quick overview of our pastured poultry operation, how much we do here, what our season is, and then we'll jump into the brooder talk. Right, so here at Heifer Ranch, we raise just under 30,000 chickens on pasture. They start here in the brooder the day that they hatch. So we get them same day they are delivered to us. They come here to our structure up here at the ranch. Um, it is a 30 foot wide structure by 100 feet long. We, you can see here, I mean, we've, we've got garage doors, we've got the exhaust fan for ventilation along the side here. We've got sliding windows. Um, and as the chicks get older, these garage doors will go open with a fence and they will get that fresh air as they are prepped towards coming into the pasture. Very cool. So the dimensions again are how much? 30 by 100. 30 by 100. And you have a lot of ventilation going on both up top with the windows here. Yep. You can open the garage doors um, up to 4,000 chicks at a time. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Awesome. Cool. Well, let's get ready to head inside, but on our way, maybe we'll check out your grain silos first. Yeah, yeah so we can come down here. Um, you can see down here we have all of our poultry grain bins here where we can load them up with the carts if you've seen our other live stream. In the center here we have our broiler starter or broiler number one. This is what the chicks get in the brooder. The, you can see down here there's an auger coming out. This white pipe comes around, curves into the brooder overhead and will feed directly into the feed pans and we'll show you that once we get inside. About uh, how often do you have to fill up this brooder? Um, so these chicks will get three tons each time for each batch. So they'll eat that their entire life. It'll last them from day one all the way up till three weeks when they move out to pasture. Very cool. Well, I imagine there is quite the operation inside. Folks, we're going to jump inside and show you what's going on in there. First, I want to say hi to uh, some of our live audience real quick. Uh, Beth Schrock out of Georgia, Mary from Washington, D.C., uh, Sturt Gaming out of Johannesburg, South Africa, Almond Farm, South Africa, so many more. Um, Ted Estro Fitchell out of Connecticut, Greenleaf Burundi. Hey, Greenleaf, thanks for joining us. We're so excited you're here. Lizzie says happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in to the live stream today. Let's go inside, what do you say? All right, sounds good. All right. 
So notice your sign on the door here. Yes. So as we come inside, we do have biosecurity rules in place here. So if you have chicks, you do want to take into consideration having some biosecurity protocols in place. So we only want you know, minimum number of people coming in and out and people that are only necessary. So if you're authorized, you can come on in. All right. So I'll authorize you thank, today. Thank you. <laughs> uh, after you, please. All right. So as we step inside, you can see that we have an alleyway here and this is just kind of so we can have a workspace where the chicks won't get into and we don't have to, we kind of have this medium space here. This is kind of our line of biosecurity. And basically what we will do when we step into the brooder, we have these boots here that I will slip on and I will put them down on this side and I will step into them. And also I have a bench in case I fall over. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I keep my, anything that these boots touch on this side and anything my, my dirty boots, my outside boots, on the other side. Awesome. So they, they stay, they don't get con contaminated by anything outside of the, your poultry area. Yes. So it basically is to prevent disease that I might have brought over from the chicken schooners and prevent them, these chicks, from getting them as well. Okay. So then I also have some hand sanitizer right here as well okay. that I'll put on. I'll get some of that. Cool, so we got clean boots. Uh, I did just wash my boots before we walked in and clean hands. Um, so welcome to inside the brooder space. It is looking magnificent in here. I'm gonna give everybody a quick look just so they can see. Um, how many chicks do you have in here right now? So we received 3,400, so we have approximately that still. Um, and we are, you know, we have, we can fit up to a max of 4,000, um, but typically our our flocks are around 3,400. Okay, awesome. So we started with feed outside a little bit. Um, why don't we go ahead yeah. and jump into, um, so just kind of the, the feed equipment that you use real quick so we can uh, discuss that. And if anybody has any questions, just gonna jump in here real quick again um, and say hey to, uh, Boo Boo Bang Bang, who just closed on five acres uh, and is getting ready to start his own pasture wow. poultry operation and really loves all our content. Thanks for watching. Uh, Amani Mahinga from Tanzania. Thanks for watching, Amani. Uh, all right, cool. So we got a great audience watching with us today. Perfect. So where, when that feed comes inside, it goes through the hopper. Yeah, so you can see that white tube that I was showing you outside mm -hmm. that comes in through up above there, the large white tube. And we also have a tube that kind of drops off in case we want to fill feed on the outside. Uh huh. But so you can fill also, up a bucket or something? Yeah, so we can use that to fill up a bucket. Then the motor that controls the auger from the tank is up above. You see it there, that's black and tan. Yep. And then it, that will pull the feed inside. It will drop it down into the hopper below, which is this okay. big metal bin. And this has a feed sensor inside it that will, when the feed drops down and fills up the hopper, it will push on that sensor. Then it will cue this motor to turn off. So as you notice, it's not running right now. Then on the, then it'll pull down into this, these feed pans here. There is another motor with kind of a similar idea with a sensor inside of it that will cue this, the auger inside this metal pipe here mm -hmm. to drop feed down into the pans. Nice, so you got one main automatic feed line running down all the way through the center of your brooder. Yep. That's nice. Um, just double check if, I don't see any questions yet. If anybody has any, just jump on in. I think we're at a good clip though. So um, what other feeders do you use inside your brooder? So you can see we start out with these red feed pans. They are basically just to make it very obvious for the chicks to find the feed. So when they're exploring their space for the first time ever, they're walking, they're walking, they're walking, and they, they walk straight across this feed, start eating it. Mm -hmm. 
So right down at, at the eye level, yeah. spaced pretty well apart. I mean, you got several of them spaced out in here. Yeah. So when you're spacing out your chicks when they first come, you want them to not have to walk more than 13 feet to find feed and water. So that's why we have lots of extra feed pans and extra feeders and extra waters. And then suddenly, you know, they'll come in across feed eventually once they keep walking around the barn. <laughs> cool. So thir 13 feet, always going to be food or water within that space. Yep. Yep. I think you've got that more than covered in here even. Yeah. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> that looks great. So what other feeders are you using inside the brooder? So these Super Bowl feeders here, they, we fill these, you know, whenever they run out, but they are nice and low to the ground, easy for the chicks to find. Um, they do, the only downside is, I mean, you can hang them, but we typically just have them sitting on the ground. So then occasionally when the chicks scratch around, they'll get shavings and such. So we also have these adult hanging feeders that you probably, if you've seen our other videos, you've probably seen these. They're in the chicken schooners. Mm -hmm. So they are there to train the chicks on these types of feeders. And also, you know, as a extra feed to have. Nice, so they're in here the whole time, pretty much? Um, these red feeders I just put in, so mm -hmm. they will get them about two weeks before they go out to pasture. It's just a training. The lip is very high for when they're little and they can't quite reach inside, so I just added them because now they can reach and also it'll train them. Gotcha. Um, and so you'll use those out on pasture and they'll be used to them by then? Yep, yep. So that'll help them to not have a learning curve when they get out to the pasture. Um, that way that when they're in a new environment, they're like, oh my gosh, grass, but they recognize this feed. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. Great. Um, so let's let's talk about um i guess if did you mention the breed that you have in here right now oh uh, we i did not so we get these chicks from keith smith's hatchery in natural dam arkansas they are a strain of cornish cross they are ross 308 mm -hmm. and uh, basically they're your gonna be your big white meat bird so they'll grow up to be about approximately six and a half pounds. Mm -hmm. We do get them straight run, so they're both sexes mixed together. Okay, gotcha. All right, yeah, I just wanted to make sure that we got that in there. I'm sure people have questions about what breeds that we're raising, so. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the spacing requirements that you give them in just a minute. Um, I wanna jump in and let everybody know that we're gonna cover some of the watering equipment next. Um, we already talked about ventilation, but if anybody has questions, just let us know. Um, so we'll show you a few more pieces of equipment, and then we have a really cool three-minute video that we prepared that we want to play for you that shows you exactly what we did, because we filmed it, the day that these chicks arrived. So they've been in here for about how long, Sam? They are 10 days old today, so they came last Monday, and like I said, we get them the same day, luckily. Okay, so they've been in here for 10 days, but the first day you do things a little bit differently, so we capture that process and are going to show you that video in just a moment. But first, uh, let's talk about the watering equipment that you have here in the brooder. And I know you have several options for the chicks to choose from. Yeah. So start wherever you'd like. So we have these nipple drinkers that are um, created by Ziggity. They, um, the way they work is that the chick will come up and they'll peck this area and will activate the water and they'll drink it as they peck it. Um, basically, this, this is nice because it's an automated system. I don't have to physically water them every day. Uh -huh. It comes straight in from our outside source, our well. Um, same with our new Poisson line. The Red Bell drinkers that you see over there. Right behind you is a close one. Oh, that's a good idea. So, so this nipple water is an automatic line, right? Yep. And it connects up there. Okay. Yes. So it and comes th in from over there by the door is the source and then there's hoses all connected. And this is also piped into that same area and where we can bring in, you know, we can medicate, we can run in, you know, whatever 
um, vitamins, electrolytes and such directly into these water lines, which is very convenient. Oh, awesome. So you can add a little bit of additional boosted energy through their water? Yeah. Nice. So you got automatic nipple lines, you have these automatic uh, bell drinkers here. And uh, we do have several questions in the chat. We're going to get to those in just a second, but I think there's one more water we want to show people. And it's right here. What do you call this one? So this is our one gallon flip over drinker is what I call it. Um, the down, this, we do start with these as a supplement drinker, but the downside of these is obviously they sit on the ground. Same with the green Super Bowl feeders. And yeah, as you can see, the chicks, you know, kick in some shavings and such. They're not very cleanly. So yeah. we do phase these out and we're in the process of that. Yeah, we're not hiding anything, folks. Um, so you can see... <laughs> I just cleaned these, I swear. Yeah, right. <laughs> it, it, it's a work in progress, always. I know it is. You're working tirelessly in here all the time. Um, okay, so we got a lot of questions coming in. I want to say thanks uh, first to our new subscribers that joined while we were live. Um, I think uh, Baby was one of them and Moo somebody, but thank you guys so much for subscribing to our channel here on YouTube where we host live streams like this every month. We create new videos every week all about regenerative agriculture, including pastured poultry, uh, forested pork, grass fed and finished cattle and sheep, uh, and from our three acre certified organic market garden. So if you're new to the channel, thanks for joining us and please consider subscribing if you're finding this content valuable. So I'm going to jump into some of your questions really quick. Um, let's see, um, Angie Schilling asked, what was the name of the hatchery that you use? It is Keith Smith Hatchery. It's located in Natural Dam, Arkansas. Okay, awesome. Thanks so much for the great question, um, Angel. Let's see, Beth Schrock um, wanted to know how you open the windows here inside the brooder. Oh yes, so the it, windows that we have are just, you know, your, ready, your everyday sliding window. They have a lock if I ever do want to lock them. Um, so the ventilation in here, aside from the exhaust fans that I can run on timers, is very manual. So I'll come in here throughout the day as it gets hotter, I'll open them up a little bit more, get the birds used to the hot air or towards the winter time, it'll be cold air that they, so they can be ready for the pasture. Awesome, cool. Thank you so much for the question about the windows. Uh, we got another question about the feed. Um, let's see, where'd it go? Uh, they wanted to know about, um, so Ted Estroficial, I probably said that wrong, Ted Estroficial wants to know how do we get chicken feed and is it the most ex is it the single biggest expense for you? So where do we get the chicken feed? So our feed comes from Hostetler's, the feed mill. Um, it's in Missouri. We do have a truck come, so we try to coordinate that with you know our other species. So if I need turkey feed, for example, or if you all know Christine Hernandez, if she needs pig feed, we'll coordinate with each other so that way we can make the truck coming down here a lot cheaper. Um, I get in here, like I said, only about three tons at a time, so obviously I need to coordinate what's going on. Right. So lots of deliveries coming through. Um, another question, real quick, from Joe Coopson. Um, Joe asked, did you install the water lines and feed lines yourselves, or did we have a company install them? I myself did not, <laughs> but we do have a maintenance department here, so luckily um, they helped me. So I basically told them how I wanted it done, how I wanted it plumbed into the other water line that we have so that I can run whatever I want into it. And basically, bing, bang, boom, a couple hours later, it was all ready to go. And then- So it, it can be DIY? Yeah, if you, got if you the have the basic plumbing skills, it's fairly simple to do, yeah, mm -hmm. which I do not. <laughs> okay, great. Hey, that's a great question from you, Joe. Thanks so much. Um, I'm going to jump back in here. Lots of questions coming through. Thanks so much for making this video uh, engaging with our audience. We love hearing from you. We love learning from you. If you have tips or tricks that you think we might need to know about, please let us know in the comments as well. So we have a lot more to show you uh, coming up. And first, though, I want to uh, take just a minute to um, see if we have any more questions. And then we're going to jump on to the next part of this video. Um, 
Beth wants to know where we'd add the electrolytes. Beth Shock, hold on to your question about adding electrolytes because we're going to show you a couple of ways that we do that uh, here in just a second. And um, someone asked about our medication schedules. We'll get back to you on the medication schedule. And I think that that gets most of the questions. So now check this out, guys. Uh, what we're going to play for you now is a short three minute video uh, that showcases what happens the day that these chicks arrive here at Heifer Ranch. So check this out. We're going to play it for you right now. Today is a big day here at Heifer USA. A new flock of chicks is being delivered today, so we're going to show you every step of the chick receiving process. Let's get started. Before our chicks arrived, we cleaned, sanitized, and prepared the brooder for their arrival. That includes replacing old bedding with fresh new pine shavings, ensuring that all our water lines and feed lines are functioning properly, and dividing the brooder into smaller sections for a technique called spot brooding. To learn more about our brooder cleaning and setup process, check out this video after the live stream ends. One of the last steps of brooder setup is ensuring that the air is clean, warm, and welcoming for the chicks. On day one of the brooder stage, the temperature should be about 92 degrees Fahrenheit or 33 degrees Celsius. The humidity should be 60% or less if possible, depending on your local climate. The CO2 level should be 2,000 parts per million or less. On the morning that the chicks arrive, it's important to ensure that all feeders and waterers are clean, full, and accessible to the chicks. We provide a bit of extra nutrition to the chicks on their first day by placing grow gel in their feed pans. This gelatin mixture provides vitamins and electrolytes to help the chicks recover from travel and start off strong. Now that the brooder is set up, we're ready to receive our chicks. We purchase our chicks from Keith Smith Hatchery in Natural Dam, Arkansas, and our trusty delivery driver hauls the chicks to the ranch. The chicks arrive in boxes that hold 100 birds each and stack safely on top of each other. After unloading all the boxes from the truck, we'll release the chicks into the brooder. With a thick coat of down feathers and a soft bed of pine shavings to land on, this process doesn't hurt the chicks and saves time for our livestock team. Now that all the chicks are on the ground in the brooder, We'll walk around the brooder to make sure everyone is awake, active, and able to access feed and water. We'll also begin filling out our record sheet with flock statistics. You can download this template along with all of the other record sheets and chore lists that we use here at Heifer USA. Check the link in the description for more information. At this point, we'll leave the brooder to give the chicks an opportunity to eat, drink, rest, and settle into their new space. We'll check back every hour to ensure that everyone has food and water access, that the temperature and humidity are correct, and that all the chicks look happy and healthy. Okay. All right. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that video that showcased what happened the day that the chicks arrived here. Lots of information there. We're gonna post that video uh, on our YouTube page a little later after this broadcast is over. If you wanna rewatch it, or this entire video will always be available for you to rewatch as well. So one thing about that video that really stood out to me that is kinda of new around here actually is the grow gel. And we've had a few questions about uh, vitamins, uh, electrolytes, what we put in the water. So we're gonna show you the water in just a second, uh, but first, let's talk about that grow gel, because I think it's really um, neat stuff, and Sam's gonna tell us a little bit more about it. All right, so this is the grow gel that you saw in the video. This is how it comes in a package. It's a powder, so what you will do with it, it basically is for, you know, a little extra kick for the birds when they first come. So it's got probiotics, it's got vitamins, it's got electrolytes, this one pack is meant for about 2,000 birds. I think I use one pack for every time we get 3,400 to 4,000 even. Um, all I do with it is mix it into a bucket and the package will tell you how much water to use. Mm -hmm. Mix it up, it'll turn like that gooey, creepy, slimy green that you saw. And I'll take a, about a handful of it and I'll just kind of crumble it across the red feed pans that we have here. The chicks love it every time that I've fed it out. They just go nuts for it. It's got 
a little bit of water in it too, so then they hydrate at the same time that they're eating it. Oh, cool. So you see good changes in their behavior. They seem to be happy when yeah, you eat it. Yeah, yeah. It'll definitely give them a little extra boost. And you, mix, and you mix that powder with water. Turns yeah. green. Yep. Nice. Cool. Yeah, it's a little standoffish, but uh, the more I learned about it, the more intrigued I was by it. So yeah. I hope our viewers <laughs> are as well. Another way that you mix in vitamins and electrolytes um, is using our water system. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, what you do here? Yes, yeah, so this is our dositon, a dositron. Mm -hmm. So like I said, our water source comes in up through the floor here, passes comes through, through right there, yeah. yep, passes through a water filter, and then down through our pressure reducer and into our dositron will pick up this solution. And I actually have Orange juice in there right yep, now. Yep, orange juice. <laughs> BVS vitamins and electrolytes. Chicken um, Gatorade. Essentially, That's yeah. That's awesome. So it's just kind of to give them a little extra boost. I feed it occasionally to them or well, have them drink it. And basically it's just another, like I said, vitamin and electrolyte. Just gives them another, just an extra boost. I do give this to them the first two to three days of, upon their arrival. That way they get a better start off to you know, help find food and water. Awesome, cool. Um, so Mary just said uh, that was a great video. Thanks, Mary, we hope you enjoyed it. Grats to Kennedy and the studio for putting that together. Um, Greenleaf and, so Greenleaf Farm and Beth, I hope that answers your questions about electrolytes, vitamins, uh, supplemental nutrition that we give to the chicks here in the brooder. Lots more to come. We're going to tell you about our spacing standards. Uh, we're going to talk about the daily chores that we do uh, here in the brooder every single day, show you some of the record sheets that we use, tell you about an exciting document that we're creating just for you to download to use on your farm, um, and so much more. So first, Sam, why don't we talk a little bit about um, the spacing standards and what we mean by spacing standards. So one thing with our pastured poultry, of course, is that we're proud of the way we raise these animals. And a lot of that has to do with the humane treatment of these animals. And it starts with how much space do they get um, here in the brooder. So we're going to put up a graphic on the screen right now that shows our spacing standards. And maybe you can tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So when we first get chicks, we can fit approximately um, one chick per 0.25 square foot. So basically that just means, like I said, the square footage of the barn is 30 by 100 foot. So we could fit them, fit more ass chicks, but because they grow up and grow into the bigger chicks, they require 0.75 square foot. Um, and like I said, that would be a max of 4,000 chicks, which we have done twice this summer. But right now, like I said, we have 3,400. Okay, great. So thanks for letting us know about the spacing standards inside the brooder here. Um, we do have a question uh, from Joe Coopson. He wanted to know where you get the green gel. I actually ordered it from QC Supply, which you can order online. They will ship directly to your house. Awesome. So you can check uh, QC Supply out, Joe. And then let's see. Oh yeah, and Joe, that, inf that link is also in the description of this video. So anybody that wants to uh, find more products that we're showing you, like the Grow Gel, um, I think the Dosatron, some of our feeder and water equipment, we've put a lot of links to the products that we trust and that we use here at Heifer Ranch in the description of this video for you to check out as well. Um, another question from Kamaruddin Kareem, and... Um, We've had another question about this earlier in the stream that I didn't get to, but it is about mortality rates. We do experience that sometimes here at the ranch. Uh, what, what mortality rates do you try to keep uh, your chicks below? So our target mortality, or you know, we don't want to go above 1% loss during the brooder time. So basically that means approximately 34 birds, um, obviously because we get 3,400. Things do happen, obviously, we get, you know, losses in the beginning and we get losses later on. But if you, you know, hold your standards high and you kind of make feed and water very obvious to them, your management is on point, then you will come up with the best product of the bird and have a lower mortality rate. Awesome. Thanks for answering that uh, 
question from Cameroon Dean. Um, so we got a few more things that we want to show folks inside here. I know you got uh, some temperature equipment, the bedding itself we haven't talked about yet. So you want to cover those two things yeah. uh, next? So our shavings first come from TLC. Mm -hmm. So we get premium bedding from TLC. It is premium horse bedding. It's got the, the fines in it. You know, if you kind of dig around, it's got little small, tiny pieces and it's got these larger chunks in it um, that just basically helps it so there's good absorption those smaller fines are going to help with the good absorption and the um, larger chunks are going to keep the dust at bay so when you're running circulation fans and exhaust fans and you have your windows all open in the heat of the summer um, or when it's really cold outside and you're running a lot of heat that's going to dry up your bedding you know the having these larger chunks is going to help keep the dust at bay. Awesome. Yeah, I've def I can definitely notice a difference between here and sometimes like the, the peat moss that we've used before and the turkey brooder. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not as bad dust wise in <laughs> here and uh, pine shavings are, are fairly economical. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. They sure are. Nice. OK. Um, and then so, temperature. We've got um, Something we're going to show folks, but what do you use to keep track of the temperature inside this space? So we have this computer here um, made by Cumberland. This is how I control the temperature in the barn. Mm -hmm. I can adjust it if I want to. I can run it off of a schedule. I start the chicks at about 92 degrees, keep them at that te same temperature for the first four days, and then I can you know, tell the computer to drop off one degree every day mm -hmm. from then on. And then as they get closer to pasture age, probably about two degrees, maybe even three degrees at the very most, if you have cold weather. You want the outside temperature as they leave to match the inside temperature. Okay, and um, if, if we haven't already, we're gonna, I think we're gonna put a graphic up on the screen um, that shows folks, it should be up right now, that shows folks the temperature schedule that we use here in the brooder. And I just want to let everybody know that that information, the temperature schedule, um, the record sheets we're about to show you, uh, the daily chores list that we go through here in the brooder, all the stuff that you saw in that short video we played earlier is going to be available very soon. And if you check the link in the description, you can find out how to get your free copy of that PDF that we have spent a lot of time putting together for our audience because we think it's going to bring a ton of value. Uh, value to you and your farm. So check out the description after this video is over to find out how to get your copy of that document. Uh, more to come. Stick around. We're going to talk about um, what we do on our daily chores here in the brooder. We're going to talk about what we do to get ready to send our chickens out to pasture, answer your questions along the way, and continue to learn together. So uh, you talked about temperature. We're about to get into the daily chores that um, you do here every day inside the brooder. And while we're over here, can you show, I, I can show, you can just talk about it real quick, um, your log there. So this is our record sheet that we have. I keep track of the highs and low temperature, the daily mortality. Um, occasionally I'll keep track of the humidity when it gets out of control. Um, but with our ventilation, that should you know, help keep the humidity at bay. So I do have, when I go through chores, I do come in and I use this temp meter. And basically it's a, it's points and it'll tell you the temperature at that exact spot where you see, if you can see that on the video, there's- It's like a laser pointer. A laser yeah. pointer um, that'll tell you, you know, 83 degrees right there, 84. Basically, this will tell me if I need to make a physical adjustments to my um, to the computer. You know, if it's really cold outside and the heaters aren't keeping up, this will tell me if the bedding itself is warm enough for the chicks. So it might be, you know, 105 underneath the heater, but it might be, you know, 70 degrees underneath way over here on the opposite side of the heater. So I do check this every day when I do chores. And then as I go through, I'll wash the waters. And if you've seen our oh. hey, video, 
let, let's do a couple questions real quick and then yeah. we'll jump to the sure. chores, if that's okay. Um, so a couple of questions did come through while you're talking about the temperature. Um, so first, <laughs> somebody said, um, slow down, you're giving away too much awesome information for free. <laughs> Um, you should charge for this oh and consult. So come and visit. <laughs> hey, come, come and visit. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization that exists here in the United States to serve, educate, um, and coordinate small scale farmers in the United States. We have a 1200 acre working ranch where we uh, teach people here on site every day. We have a residential program where you can l come live and learn with us here at Heifer Ranch and be a part of this and everything else you see on our YouTube page. So. Uh, we're glad that you're finding the video valuable. That is what is all about for us. Uh, we'll continue to do that for you here on YouTube and here at Heifer Ranch if anyone is able to join us in Perryville, Arkansas. Um, Joe asked about the boot rack. I'll show you real quick, Joe, at the beginning of the stream, we just showed our boot rack where we change our boots before we get into the schooner uh, for up, or into the brooder <laughs> for proper biosecurity pr protocols. Um, so we did have a question about the temperature schedule specifically, I think, and that is going to be in that PDF document that I've talked about where you can, and you can find information how to get that in the description of this video. So the full temperature schedule, uh, chores schedule, everything, so much information that will help you in your farming journey. Oh yeah, the light schedule. That's what the question was about. Thank you, Kennedy in the studio. Uh, uh, is going to also be in that document as well, the light schedule. Um, one last question. Uh, just a comment from Joe. He said that this past year they've used uh, peat moss for the first three batches of the years and then wood shavings for the rest of the season to practice a deep bedding method and only clean it out once at the end of the year. Yep, that's exactly what we do. We do deep bedding. We do do occasional, you know, when, we, when we've had, you know, too much humidity and we notice well this this time the, the bedding didn't look very good um, we will clean it out maybe about halfway through right now we've got I can dig down but we've got about three layers of bedding mm -hmm. in here so we've got from two batches before this and then the previous batch and then this new batch we get we put shavings on top everywhere and then we try to keep that covered you know in case there was some issues with the previous flock disease-wise. Um, if you do have issues with disease, you probably do want to clean that out. Okay. Um, so we, we did have uh, another question. Or actually, let's jump into the chores uh, and then we'll get to the questions. Okay. okay. So when I come in, I will scan the room and kind of look at the chick's behavior. If they are grouping anywhere, if they're piling anywhere, they're favoring one, one area, um, I will adjust the, the ventilation. Sometimes it can be some sort of airflow issue. Um, so I right, right now, would you say heat. that this is well, I mean, they're pretty well spaced out, right? Yeah. When they're spread out like this, they're perfect. They're comfortable. Right now we don't have the heaters running because it's hot enough outside that we don't need any heat. Um, if you've seen our heaters there, mm -hmm. um, you got one in the background back there. Yep. Yep. So those They're are, not on right now, fortunately, otherwise we would be cooking. <laughs> they do get pretty toasty the hotter, the closer you get to them, <laughs> mm -hmm. when they're running anyways. Um, every day when I come in, and I'll also do this in PM chores because the chicks like to dig around and kick shavings inside, as you can see. Uh huh. Um, I'll take around this scouring pad. Let me see that. Let me show. So it's just like a, a green Brillo pad or whatever? Yeah, yeah. So uh -huh. I'll just take this and I'll kind of, you know, wash it around like this and I'll dump out the dirty water into a bucket and then go to go around to each um, plasson that I have. I'll fill up their feeders. They're again getting chick starter still. So I'll fill it up from directly from my hopper and essentially just kind of look at them as I go along. Nice. So cleaning the waterers, filling up the feeders, checking on the birds behavior, making sure there's no signs of discomfort, mm -hmm. um, good airflow and ventilation. And uh, those are the keys to a happy chick life, right? Yep, yep. I want to live here. So. <laughs> pretty much do. <laughs> it's pretty comfy. I mean, now that we're kneeling down, it's a nice comfy floor. Um, I, I think as everybody can see, you know, all the chicks in here are doing quite well. Some of them are taking a little rest. Uh, some of them are getting a snack and getting a drink and 
Yep. And if you see They're panting, really like I said, it's hot outside. We don't have air conditioning in here. Mm -hmm. So that is the deal. So it's natural getting warm it's natural yep. this is what will happen when they're out in the schooners as well they'll that's their way to, to cool off okie dokie let's jump in. i'm gonna jump in here and we'll answer a few more questions uh first i want to say uh thank you so much to our most recent subscriber luciano thanks for joining us here at heifer usa if you're new to the channel and are finding this content valuable please consider subscribing uh, to support what we're doing and let's see, let's ask, ask, answer a couple of questions. Uh, Streetcar with Dante says, we are proud of you all. So thanks so much, Streetcar. Uh, we appreciate your, your support. Grim Panda says they're on 26 acres and they want to know if they put chicks on, or chicks on pasture, is there such a thing as too much free range, um, like too much spacing, right? Or is there a benefit to keeping them on smaller areas of pasture? That depends if you want them to fertilize your area. So we have our schooners. The schooners are kind of built there to keep the chickens contained and as well as protected from predators. So that when we do have a predator come around, like the coyotes that we have seen once in a while, um, mm -hmm. they will be protected from them. So that is one thing to consider when you're free ranging your chickens. But if you're not concerned about that, you don't have predator issues and you're not concerned about you know, fertilizing your your grass, your pasture, then you can certainly free range them. Okay, that's a great answer. And if you're curious what uh, we mean by chicken schooner and you don't know that term, check out some of the other videos on our pastured poultry playlist here on our page and you can see the entire process of us raising chickens out on pasture from start to finish. We have several videos for you to check out and continue your learning journey uh, with us here at Hever USA. Um, so Greenleaf Farm wanted to know if we offer a volunteer program or paid internship for non-Americans. So Greenleaf, we have in the past, ever since COVID has been around, we've had to shift gears and change things up. Um, but there may be plans to accept international volunteers again in the future. So I would encourage you to go ahead and submit an application to the volunteer program. Because uh, there is a chance that we will be able to open it back up to international volunteers once COVID is done and gone and behind us. Um, and same, same for you, Cameroon Dean. If you're in Nigeria, um, same, same program there potentially may be available. For now, though, we can just reach you via our live streams um, live here at Heifer Ranch. And let's see. I think, I think that's uh, all the questions that we have for now. So anything else that you want to cover about your chores or your routine um, <laughs> and just your day-to-day -day before we start talking about uh, the next section will be getting ready for their journey out to pasture. So when I do make adjustments with the ventilation, or if I want to just monitor the ventilation, mm -hmm. this basically is a, a probe that um, will tell me the carbon dioxide and the humidity. Mm -hmm. So I'll turn it, if I turn it on, it counts down from 30 seconds. You want me to turn it on? Sure, yeah, let's see it. It'll take a while, but... We may um, not watch the whole thing, but... It'll count down from 30 seconds and it'll tell me how fresh the air is or it'll give me a good idea of how fresh the air is. What Tyler and I are breathing out right now is carbon, di carbon dioxide. What the chicks are breathing out is carbon dioxide. And what the heaters inside are burning up is the good oxygen. So that will, you know, give us a key idea um, how well we're ventilating the barn. Um, so. Okay, it's about to give us a reading. Let's hope that we're going to live a few seconds longer. <laughs> so you want it to be under, and I'm also talking into it, so keep that yeah, in mind. Yeah. You want it to be under 2,000 mm -hmm. in the summer. Mm -hmm. In the winter, you can probably run it around 2,500 parts per million. So mm -hmm. that's going to be this top number is the CO2. Mm -hmm. And then this number down here is the temperature in Celsius. And over here is going to be the humidity, so it is 39%. All right, so we're in the clear. We're going to live a <laughs> little bit longer. Um, and that information was in that short video as well. If, if we're covering anything too fast for anybody, or if you want to rewatch this entire training workshop, 
Um, this video will be available right after the live broadcast is over. If you're watching the recorded version of this once the live is over, sign up for our email newsletter so that you can join us next time that we go live here at Heifer Ranch. It's an experience uh, I don't think you would want to miss out on. It's a lot of fun. We're broadcasting in 1080p high definition, answering your questions in real time. Nobody on YouTube does anything like this, and we're having so much fun doing it. So sign up to our email newsletter list so you can be notified well in advance of every time that we plan to go live here at Heifer USA. But as always, if you have questions, you're watching the recorded version, get your questions down in the comments, and we will get back to you right away. Um, what? So Ted asked, uh, asked about the name of that again and who makes um, it. So this is a CO2 meter. Mm -hmm. So I believe it's made by AZ, but I got it on you, uh, not YouTube, <laughs> <laughs> um, Amazon. So basically, if you just look up this information here, that should bring you directly to this one. They, um, Amprobe also makes one. It's probably about double what this one costs, and this is the exact same thing. It's about a hundred dollars. Okay. So um, if you just search CO2 meter, you should yeah, be able to find something. Yeah, you typically like find that. something that looks like a really old cell phone. So. <laughs> okay, great. All right, so um, I think we're we've covered all the questions. Um, let me check this out. So now we're going to talk about what we do to get ready. Unless you had anything else on chores. No. Nope, okay, ahead. cool. So now we're going to talk about um, about what period, how many weeks in. Do you go to the pasture? So about between two and a half to maybe three and a half. Um, we, we try not to go over two and a half, three mm -hmm. weeks of age, but sometimes our schedule with the previous batch runs into each other. So these chicks will be leaving here, you know, fairly soon. So even though they, it feels like they just got here. Basically, what we do to prepare them to go to the pasture is, as you can see in that video that you watched in the beginning, we started out with cardboard rings. That cardboard is called brooder guard if you're interested and that type of brooding I learned a new term is called spot brooding. Spot brooding and brooder guard and I'm going to show this cardboard <laughs> real quick just so everybody knows what we're talking about. This is the leftover remnants of what was a giant ring of cardboard. Well several giant rings of cardboard. You can see the leftovers down there too. Yep. Um, and so you're, you've, you've taken those down right? Yeah so basically as they get older probably around five days of age I will cut out a section of it, you know, just give them a little bit of space, you know, between these two rings, combine it, and then same with the far two rings. Mm -hmm. Then as they get a little bit older, I'll combine all the rings, and then I'll take away that section that I had along the wall that you probably saw in the video. And that way they can, it keeps them in smaller communities and groups of what we have is max of a thousand. So then, that way there's less competition for feed. You won't find all your birds on one side of the barn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, if there's any issues with grouping, you'll only have it within that one community, hopefully. So basically, we'll just kind of phase them out. So fairly soon, over the next couple of days, that cardboard will be completely gone. So when, when we showed the spacing standards earlier to increase those spaces while they're in this phase, you, you open up the cardboard structures. Yep. And keeping them all compacted in the beginning, I'm sure helps them get their food and water. Did you mention that? Yeah, so right. it'll, it'll basically keep them close to the heat source, close to the food source, close to the water source. They don't have as far to go. And it'll also keep them off of that colder concrete wall that we have. Okay, great. We do have a question. Um, let's see, Grim Panda wants to know if there is a specific reason you use that cardboard and not just any old cardboard. Um, it's specifically designed for this purpose. It comes in gigantic big rolls, um, and I'll roll it out as I... And it is, cor I'm going to show that it's corrugated, and that probably yeah. helps it maintain some structure. It, yeah, it helps it, you know, have some ventilation, helps it, and I do use these um, metal ring paper stands, I believe they're called. You can also find these online at QC Supply. Mm -hmm. um, we... They come, this brooder guard comes in two sizes, so if you're just brooding chicks, I mean, the, this size, I believe, is 12 inches, is just fine. If you happen to be brooding turkeys, you probably want to get 18 inch. Okay. So, um, so Grim, there's probably no reason you can't use regular cardboard um, other than it'll just take you a lot longer than unrolling something like this that stands up fairly well on its own. And it's probably a minimal investment, I would imagine. Yeah, so it's not, not very expensive. expensive. Um, so the amount of time it's going to save you may be worth it. It just 
probably depends on the size of your, your operation, I would guess. Yep. Um, let's see, one more question. A couple more. Um, Joe Coopson asked, how many chicks per brooder heater? Oh, okay, so We're not using each... the heaters right now. It's middle of September. They come on sometimes. <laughs> middle but... of September in Arkansas. Yeah, we'll middle of that. September in Arkansas. <laughs> Um, and our season run, we do a little bit in the cooler season, and we raise this up to 90, 92 two degrees Fahrenheit. So we do use the heaters. What's yeah. kind of your spacing requirements? So I have two heaters per ring just to basically make sure that in case it's a fail safe, really, that mm. one heater just happens to go out in the middle of the night while I'm sleeping. Then I have that other heat source that the chicks can wander over to and stay warm. And this is propane? This, yes, this is propane. This is a space ray heater. Uh, we have a gas line that feeds in from the outside and the gas comes in through here and ignites here and causes a big flame, which awesome. is really hot, so we won't turn it on. <laughs> cool. Um, Sue Yost, I don't know if you know that person, but they said happy birthday, Sam. It's weird. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Sue. Um, let's see. One more question. Where Beth wanted to know where you got the cardboard. Um, I there's a couple places that we've gotten cardboard from before. I have ordered it in the mail. That typically takes a bit longer um, from QC Supply. Like I said, that I think they have two different sizes. Otherwise, this batch uh, or these rolls that I got that I used this flock came from Russellville Dixon Poultry. Um, they are great guys. They've they helped us with getting a lot of our equipment installed here. Okay, great. All right. Um, so back to what you do to get ready for um, going out on pasture. Um, yeah. They've been here for about two to three weeks. And what's next? So one of the main things that I mentioned before was the temperature schedule. So I do start them at 92 degrees on my computer. So we have a temp sensor here um, that we can talk briefly about. Yeah, we can show that. It's uh, a little small, but we'll get a little closer to it. So this temp sensor basically helps to keep the barn at a good temperature. This is the going to give me an average of the barn. So it's not necessarily what I'm going to be reading directly under the heater, which is why I have my, my gun, my uh, temperature gun. Mm -hmm. And so basically I'll be dropping the temperature slowly, gradually to get them used to the outside temperature. So as you can see today, all of our windows are wide open so that the birds can feel the air coming in from the outside. It's very natural air. As the birds get older, the exhaust fans will be running continuously and we'll also be opening our garage doors that we have that you can see down in the end. We have fence panels to prevent the birds from going outside and predators coming inside. And Basically, that will get them used to the outside temperature again, like I said. So that, that's crucial, acclimating them to yeah. the outside conditions that they're going to be going into yeah, for sure. slowly over time. Yeah, so that's going to be the key thing is getting them acclimated to the outside temperature. And basically, like I said, we'll be removing this cardboard completely. Mm -hmm. We will also be phasing out, which I already started, phasing out the supplemental feeders and supplemental waterers. So this so, feed pan, yep, this red supplemental. feed pan that we have, and then those one gallon flip over drinkers that we showed you earlier, uh -huh. those will all be gone. Yep. And then the equipment that they need to learn how to use, which is the red feed pans and the red plissons, the bell drinkers that we have over so here. So this one right here and that one back yep. there are staying because they're yep. staying with them in the schooners. They will stay and they're basically training them so that once they get out on pasture, we don't have these red bell plissons on pasture, but we do have a very similar shape and color drinker so that they can quickly find where they want their water source. Awesome. Um, and anything else that you do or is that it? I mean, uh, just get it, get them ready for the temperature and the food and water. Um, make sure they say their goodbyes to, to their yeah, little house um, here. But. And then I will show you how, how we get them out to the pasture. Yeah, that would be great. So when we're getting them ready to go out to the pasture, basically we will make a smaller catch pen that we will bring 
uh, approximately 500 birds, which we put into the, the schooner. Um, so we will catch that group in a smaller penned off area over there in the corner that you see. That way we have smaller controlled groups. The birds will stay calm. We stay calm. We don't have to go far to chase them around the barn. And then we use these to put the chicks into. So these have a flap on them. And basically what we will do is grab the bird and put it inside. If you've seen our video, there is a video on how we do this, moving the chicks to yeah, the pasture. Yeah, let me jump in real quick. So at the end of the video we played you earlier, um, we highlighted our moving chicks to pasture YouTube video. And if you want to see the complete process of loading up these thousands of chicks and taking them out to their new homes on pasture, check out that video. It's really informative and I think you'll really enjoy it. And you can see exactly how we use a lot of these, um, a few great hand, helping hands yep. and get it knocked out um, just in probably a couple of hours, really. Not too bad. Yeah, um, it, I think if we have enough help, it's probably about one hour per schooner. So we can knock it out in a day or we can knock it out in a couple days. Nice. However quickly we want to move. All right, well, I think um, we're going to answer just a couple more of your questions, and then we're going to sign off. We've showed me most everything that we have, uh, but we really appreciate you sticking around. If you found value in this video, if you've enjoyed the content, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel so you can get notifications every time that we go live just like this or any of the weekly content that we produce on regenerative agriculture here at Hever USA. Okay, another question from I am Salia. They want to know where you get that temperature sensor from that is hanging from the ceiling. We got ours from Dixon Poultry, like I said. They helped us set up a lot of this equipment in the barn. Um, you can also find a lot of them on QC Supply, like I said. There's also good, a lot of other good companies. It, basically, if you search you know, temperature sensors, they make some for swine barns, I believe, also. But you want to make sure that you have one that's compatible with your your computer that you are running. Okay, nice. So that should answer your question, um, Celia. And um, one last question from, let's see, Cameroon Kareem, the standard stocking density. So Cameroon, that information for spacing standards, which will help you get your stocking density, I believe, if you follow our same spacing standards anyways, will be in that PDF document that you can find out how to get at, in the description of this video. So I did mention at the beginning of the live stream that um, you can win prizes by watching our live streams. You probably didn't know that. But if you check out another one of our links in the description, it'll be a Google Forms link. It's a, a, an evaluation feedback. So we're a nonprofit organization. And as such, we would love to continuously hear from you, our viewers, about this experience, about what you liked about it, what you learned, what you think you might implement on your farm, what we could do better. Um, and if you would take just a moment to fill out that form, again, the link is in the description, then you will be entered for a chance to win one of half a dozen Heifer USA hats. I don't have mine on today, but it's blue. It's really cool, a really good quality hat. Um, and a couple of t-shirts as well. So pretty good chances for you to win some prizes. It would really mean a lot to us. Sorry, microphone. If you would take just a second to give us some feedback about this live stream event, regardless of whether or not you want the prize. Um, so yeah, thank you all so much for wa watching. Thanks, Robert Curry. Thanks, Tampa J. Uh, thanks, I am Celia. Everybody from all over the world, wherever you're at, whether it's the morning, the afternoon or in the middle of the night. Thanks for joining us here at Heifer Ranch uh, with Heifer USA. I'm Tyler Pearson. That's birthday girl, Sam Noble. Uh, we've really enjoyed this live stream tour and we hope that you did too. So we'll see you next time. Sounds good. All right, bye everybody. Bye.